Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this CCAN webinar, How Can System Dynamics Support Policy Evaluation? Um, you can see numbers are gradually clicking up. We've got a well-attended webinar this afternoon. I'm Ben Shaw, I'm Deputy Director of CCAN, the Centre for Evaluation Complexity Across the Nexus. Um, before I hand over to our speaker, Jonathan Nichols, uh, I'm just going to do a brief introduction to CCAN. I hope most of you are familiar with it, but a few of you won't be. I'm just going to do a brief introduction to what CCAN is and uh, do a little bit of housekeeping, but uh, do that quite quickly and then hand over to uh, Jonathan. So CCAN is the Centre for Evaluation Complexity Across the Nexus. Um, we've tried to bring together in a research centre people from policy backgrounds, evaluation backgrounds, complexity backgrounds and nexus backgrounds. And by nexus we mean the interaction of environmental uh, aspects. Um, and bring together aspects from all those domains to get us better at evaluating policy on the environment. Um, we've been a very challenge-led centre. We've been uh, working collaboratively with government uh, and a number of government departments and agencies. And our aim is to be to develop, test and build capacity to use novel uh, evaluation methods which are complexity appropriate. Um, we've been in existence since 2016 and um, have found it quite an interesting process of understanding not just evaluation but the process of uh, policy development. Um, you can't think about complexity in policy without thinking of it through the whole policy process. So that's uh, enough of, about an introduction to CCAN. There's lots of material on the CCAN website. We're quite active on Twitter and, and Facebook. So if you want more information, do have a look at the CCAN website. Um, for today's webinar, uh, Jonathan Nichols is going to speak in a moment. Um, the seminar, or Jonathan will speak for about 45 minutes. Um, uh, during this, the, uh, the whole session, only the presenter and uh, the chair can speak. Uh, if you've got um, questions you want to ask on Jonathan's presentation, please post them at any point in the webinar in the uh, question box in the Zoom uh, webinar control panel. Um, and we'll come back to them. Hopefully we'll have a few questions at the end and we'll try and work our way through those at the end of the session. Um, the session will be recorded and made available on the CCAN website in due course. So do have a look at it and pass it on if you find of interest. Um, and uh, there's uh, all the other webinars uh, we've done are there along with uh, other resources. So uh, that's enough from me, enough from uh, about CCAN. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan Nichols in a, in a moment. He's uh, going to speak about systems and dynamics. Uh, he's going to draw on work he's been involved in and uh, his uh, recent training in this area and a CCAN fellowship which he was working on last year, which was a very interesting example of uh, how to apply systems dynamic to a policy evaluation challenge. So uh, I think that's enough introduction. Jonathan, if you're ready to go, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, everyone. Hello everyone, thanks very much for the introduction Ben. Um, so uh, welcome all to the webinar and today um, I'll be talking uh, about system dynamics and how it can support policy evaluation. So to do that I'll be guiding you through a, a presentation of uh, about 45 minutes and here we're going to address uh, three key questions. So first of all we'll start from scratch and we'll consider just what is system dynamics. Second, we'll look into how system dynamics can tackle some of the specific challenges um, posed by complex systems for policy evaluation. And third, we'll look at, uh, we'll explore some of the insights that CCAN's research using system dynamics has generated so far. Okay, so let's get right into it. What is system dynamics? Well, um, it's a method for developing models and by that we mean both qualitative diagrams and computer simulation models. And we use those models to help us to learn about dynamic complexity and understand the sources of policy resistance. And by doing this, we aim to design more effective policies. As the presentation progresses, we'll delve into a little deeper how all of this works. But at this point, uh, there's just three things that I'd like to, uh, to highlight. So first of all, what, what is this fancy term dynamic complexity? Well, that just means that things are difficult because they change over time. If we think of things like national GDP or 
the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, also maybe the number of coronavirus uh, cases in a region, or even how your mood changes over the course of a day or a week. And these are all things which change over time, and we need to learn why these patterns arise if we want to see uh, good patterns rather than bad patterns. The second thing that I want to highlight here is this idea of policy resistance. And that's when you try to solve, solve a, a problem by intervening um, and either nothing changes or things are getting worse over time, quite uh, contrary to your hopes and expectations. And often that happens because maybe you haven't fully understood the structure underlying the problem that you're trying to solve. And this links to the third point that I want to highlight uh, in this definition is that system dynamics is all about learning. So we use models to learn about this, the, uh, the patterns that we see developing over time and the structures that, that, uh, that lie behind them. So in essence, what we can say is that system dynamics is a method to enhance learning in complex systems. Well, that's great. Um, so where did system dynamics come from? Well, the principles of uh, system dynamics are, are grounded in nonlinear dynamics and control theory, which was developed in mathematics, physics, and engineering. But also because we apply these principles to human as well as physical, natural, and technical systems, the method also draws on aspects of social science, economics, and psychology. The method was developed in the 1950s by uh, J. Wright Forrester, and the method was developed to help corporate managers to improve their understanding of industrial processes. And that work was published uh, in the 1961 book, Industrial Dynamics, and that's considered to be the, the founding text of the method. System dynamics was subsequently applied to study what we might now call nexus problems, um, and that was done as early as the 1960s and 1970s, uh, as exemplified in books such as Urban Dynamics and The Limits to Growth, and the method has been widely used uh, ever since those days. To give you a broader idea of what we're really doing when we apply system dynamics, we're actually using it as a framework and a toolkit to enable us to think in systems. Essentially, this means going beyond understanding the problems we want to solve as just isolated events, um, which are really just the tip of the iceberg. So we, we, we start to, 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 uh, to achieve this by taking what we call a, a dynamic perspective. So we look at the, uh, the key variables to see how they have developed historically to start to frame uh, problems as patterns over time. We then uh, use models like uh, diagrams and computer simulation uh, models to go deeper under the surface to help us understand how those patterns over time are driven by system structures. And to go even deeper uh, under the surface, um, into the pro in the process of doing this, we actually refine our own mental models. And by that, I mean our understanding of a problem. We can then use that new understanding uh, to design new policies and to evaluate them in a more complexity appropriate way. Now, during this introduction, uh, I've mentioned that a big thing in system dynamics is the use of models. But before I go into how those models work and what they look like, I want to just revisit the idea of why we would want to build models to support policy design and evaluation in general. And one reason is that models can provide us with a useful simplification of reality or a micro world. And that needs to be accurate enough so that we can run experiments which would otherwise be too dangerous or expensive or take too long in the real world. And it's the same idea as why um, an aeroplane pilot would learn to fly with a simulator rather than jumping uh, straight into the, the cockpit of a, a jumbo jet. Um, in addition to this, though, there's another reason um, that we might use models, and, and that's that they're often competing perspectives uh, about the causes underlying a complex problem and, and also how it should be addressed. So we can use models as what we call a boundary object to uh, interrogate, and we can use that to form the basis of a, a shared understanding among, among different stakeholders. But of course, in practice, those two things are intertwined. So 
there's no point in discussing a boundary object if it doesn't bear some resemblance to at least somebody's reality. And there's no point in running experiments in a, in a micro world if decision makers don't align on, on its assumptions. Now this point is, is actually relevant to, uh, to all model-based methods. So I want to take the question a, a step further to consider why, we'd, why we would want to build uh, system dynamics models in particular. And ultimately, this comes down to a point that is often underplayed uh, even by policy consultants who use system dynamics on a daily basis. And this is that system dynamics models help us to understand the endogenous sources of the problems that we're interested in solving. Now by that, what I mean is how the elements inside a system are interconnected and influence each other through feedback loops of circular causality. It also means that the influences coming from outside a system boundary are only important due to the way that they influence the feedback processes inside the boundary. Or to put it more simply, it's the phenomena by which A leads to B, which leads to more A. And through this structure, the system ultimately drives its own behavior through interconnected feedback processes. Now, when we don't take an endogenous perspective, and we don't recognize that the structure of the system is, is generating its own behavior, we run the risk of uh, running into policy resistance and potentially feeding the problems that we're trying to solve. Without this perspective, we can also miss out on opportunities for harnessing the power of complex uh, systems in order to, for example, harness uh, feedback processes to push things in the direction that we, we want them to go. So as both uh, micro worlds and as boundary objects, um, we can say that system dynamics models uh, empower us to bring this endogenous perspective to policy making. To achieve this uh, in practice, we typically follow three steps. So first we aim to uncover those endogenous sources of problematic behavior. And we do that by iterating between building and testing different model structures what we call in system dynamics, dynamic hypotheses. We compare those with uh, evidence and data about the problem that we're looking at. There's also a long tradition of building SD models uh, in participatory group settings uh, as well. Next in the process, um, we identify leverage points within the feedback structure where policy interventions might produce a relatively big effect with a relatively small push. And we do that by analyzing how the feedback loops interact in the model structure over time. And if our model is a quantitative model, then we can run computer simulations and compare various scenarios. In the third step, um, we use the model that we built and our new understanding of the feedback system to uh, begin to design and test policy options. We do that by building new policy structures into the model to run virtual experiments. And we can run different scenarios and sensitivity tests to understand how the policy might work uh, in a rather similar way that we uh, ran tests to understand the problem. Th this process actually is quite similar to other model-based policy design methods. But the, the feature which I would say is unique to system dynamics and, and actually presents the most valuable uh, opportunity for evaluation is in analyzing the feedback structures um, to identify leverage points. And th this is what I'd say where we can start to frame complexity as an opportunity as well as a challenge for policy evaluation. And it's an idea that I'll return to uh, later in the presentation. So moving on now, what, what do system dynamics models look like? Well, there are two main types of model. And the first kind is called a, a causal loop diagram, or CLD. And that's a qualitative representation of how variables connect to one another to form feedback loops. In, in this fun example, we can illustrate the basic idea. So if we have more eggs, we have more chickens, and then we'll have more eggs and so on in a reinforcing feedback loop. But at the same time, if we have more chickens, we also have more road crossings. And since chickens might not be the most streetwise creatures, we then have less chickens and that forms a balancing feedback loop. 
it's the interactions between these feedback loops and how they change uh, in, in importance over time, which uh, produces dynamic complexity. So it's really important to use diagrams like these uh, to depict the feedback loops that, that are important in the system. This uh, particular type of modeling tool, causal loop diagrams, um, is really good for communicating the essence of a model structure or a, or a dynamic hypothesis and for building models with others, others uh, in groups. To show you a, an example of that, this is a CLD from a recent paper on COVID-19. And I'm presenting this uh, certainly not with a view to looking at the, the diagram in any detail right now. Actually, what I want to highlight here is the purpose of this qualitative model. And the authors, uh, which you can follow up uh, on after this uh, presentation, um, what they highlighted was they wanted to illustrate the so-called wicked complexity of COVID as a socioeconomic rather than simply a medical phenomenon. And it's important to, uh, to appreciate that and to uh, potentially harness the feedback process that processes that we see in the system um, when we're designing long-term sustainable strategies for tackling the virus. The other type of um, modeling tool that we, uh, that we use in system dynamics is the stock and flow diagram. So with the right computer software or programming expertise, this uh, enables us to build quantitative uh, simulation models. And with this tool, um, we can represent causal relationships in a mathematical way. And we can also distinguish between uh, different types of variables, and most crucially, stocks which accumulate things over time and flows which either feed or deplete those stocks. And this type of modeling tool is really suited to running experiments and testing different scenarios. Um, as well as exploring the implications of features like delays and shifts in uh, feedback loop dominance over time. It also helps us to identify leverage points in a system uh, so we can begin to uh, design and evaluate new policy structures. Another sort of interesting point to note is that the quantitative nature of this tool uh, also means that we can generate outputs that contribute to other policy appraisal processes like calculating uh, net present values and cost benefit ratios. To illustrate the, the use of uh, this model uh, with an example, here's a graph that has become uh, all too familiar to us over the last few months. And this is a graph of infections and deaths from an infectious disease. Here's the stock and flow and feedback structure that generated this particular graph. And my point here is not to say that uh, system dynamics is necessarily any better than any other approach for um, epidemiological modeling, although certainly there's a lot of examples uh, where it's been applied to help tackle infectious diseases. Um, actually, my point is, is that these are the kind of graphs here on the right that you can generate from a system dynamic structure. And this uh, structure depicted on the left is exactly the structure that, that created this uh, graph on the right. So ultimately, um, it's the patterns of behavior that we see in the graph uh, that result from the stock and flow and, and the feedback structures that we've captured in the model, i.e. they are coming from the structure of the system. And that's the endogenous uh, perspective that I was talking about earlier. When, when we have a stock and flow uh, model, we can also use that structure to design and evaluate new policies. So for example, uh, like a quarantine intervention for those infected with a virus. Um, we can also use the model to identify some important assumptions uh, in introducing policies. So for example, uh, important assumptions like having a, a world beating uh, test track and trace program um, and explore how those assumptions might influence uh, whether our proposed interventions uh, might be successful and also uh, if they're not successful, why, why that might be. Now, having said all that about modeling, um, I would like to point out that although models are absolutely an essential uh, component of system dynamics, it's actually a method that includes more than just models and modeling. So as I mentioned earlier, 
there's a rich tradition in system dynamics of using models in participatory settings. Um, and there's plenty of guidance uh, available um, for different types of facilitation practices and even workshop uh, recipes for incorporating stakeholders' knowledge into policy design and, and evaluation. In addition to that, there's also a, a vibrant community of uh, international system dynamics practitioners and researchers. There's an international uh, SD society. Um, there's special interest groups there for, for certain topics like uh, health or environment or food systems, as well as local chapters uh, in each uh, country and, and an annual conference. And finally, um, given how long the method has been in use as well as its versatility, there's really a mature and constantly expanding casebook of system dynamics applications in both the public and the private sectors with plenty of uh, well-documented lessons for us all to, uh, to draw on. To highlight just a few of those applications, which you might be interested in following up on uh, after the webinar today, probably the best known example is the Limits to Growth study, which was published in the 1970s. And this work uh, involved building a, a highly aggregated model of the world system um, to explore how uh, infinite economic growth and population growth might play out on a finite planet. And that the insights of that work uh, provide the basis of the sustainability agenda and numerous initiatives today. More recently than that, um, system dynamics was also used in the Monroe review of the child protection system in England. And that work revealed the implications of a compliance culture that had developed in the profession, um, as well as the influence of past policies on current operations. And system dynamics provided an organizing framework for the report's recommendations. More recently still, uh, a lot of COVID modeling has been done using various methods, and, and I'd recommend uh, checking out a, a CCAN blog uh, on those different methods. Um, but using system dynamics, there was a UK-based uh, consultancy and research firm uh, which used system dynamics models to support the uh, COVID response in the, in the Kent and Medway region of England. So we started this um, section of the presentation with the question, what is system dynamics? And I would like to conclude that part with uh, the key message that system dynamics is a mature model-based policy design and evaluation method. It's most contribu uh, valuable contribution that I would say is uh, in not only providing the tools to take an endogenous perspective on those problems that we're trying to address, but also in its rich uh, case history. Um, it's also its participatory tradition and its vibrant community of uh, practitioners. Okay, so um, we know what system dynamics is now, but what does it have to offer in the specific context of policy evaluation and the challenges uh, presented by what some of us call complexity or complex systems? And to address this, I'd just like to start by touching on why we need policy evaluation in the first place. And this is the unfortunate fact that things sometimes don't work out how we'd planned. And in policy, that's sometimes because of what systems thinkers call the counterintuitive behavior of social systems. Some everyday examples are fairly familiar to us. So we build more roads to relieve traffic, but somehow there ends up being more traffic than before. So we need to build more roads. Something I think maybe all of us can find is that we've got more technology at our disposal than ever before, but uh, we should be working less, but somehow we seem to have less uh, leisure time. In agriculture, it seems that the more pesticide we use, uh, the more we need to use. And in healthcare, we've uh, had great success using antibiotics, um, but in the process, uh, we seem to have produced more virulent pathogens and reduced the effectiveness of those antibiotics over time. So because social systems can be counterintuitive, um, that's one of the reasons that we need policy evaluation. And the point of policy evaluation is um, so that policymakers can understand what works, uh, why, or indeed why not, and who is affected and in what ways. 
And that's actually the definition of policy evaluation according to um, the Magenta Guide. And in case uh, anybody's unfamiliar with, with that, um, it's the UK's, uh, UK government's guidance on policy evaluation. Now, to take this a step further, um, we'll have a look at complex systems. Um, and the trouble with complex systems is that they have various properties that make things behave in an especially counterintuitive way. So, for example, complex systems have features which we've discussed earlier, like change over time or dynamic complexity. There are also feedback mechanisms and uh, they generate puzzling behavior which emerge uh, from uh, hidden structures below the tip of the iceberg. Complex systems can also be full of nonlinear relationships between system components, and that makes it much harder to predict how an intervention will work in practice. There are also uh, leverage points and hubs that we need to be aware of, as well as path dependencies, uh, domains for stability and tipping points. And that's not to mention that there can also be uh, multiple uh, perspectives and different actors with different goals and values. If all that isn't uh, challenging enough, um, for all of those uh, reasons that I've already mentioned, um, complex systems are themselves not only difficult to understand, but are also difficult to communicate about. And in evaluation, all of these properties uh, intensify the challenges that evaluators uh, already have to grapple with when helping to figure out what works and why. So clearly there's a need for complexity appropriate methods to address those challenges. Now, I don't think there's uh, any need for me to go into further detail here on exactly what each of these properties are and how they pose challenges for evaluation. And that's because CCAN has already done uh, a great job of doing that in the su supplementary guide on uh, complexity, uh, which is an appendix to the Magenta guide. There's also various other webinars uh, available on the website about how these um, properties pose challenges for evaluation. So I really recommend um, that you, you check those out if you're interested in, in learning more. What, what I'm really keen to highlight uh, about these properties is that system dynamics has features that can uh, handle each of these properties of complex systems. So change over time, feedback, emergence, nonlinearity, levers and hubs, path dependency and tipping points, they can all be handled through the system dynamics modeling language and model analysis procedures. Multiple perspectives uh, of different actors in the system and the challenges of communicating complexity can also be handled through the use of participatory modeling or group model building, GMB, as we call it in system dynamics. And there's, there's also plenty of uh, visualization tools and interactive model interfaces that can help make uh, complex models uh, more accessible. So in this way, um, we can say that system dynamics can tackle the various challenges that complexity poses uh, for evaluators. And that's uh, part of my second key message for the presentation today. And that's that, uh, that uh, system dynamics can support policy evaluation by enabling users to understand how the properties of complex systems promote or hinder policy success. And that's the ability to understand the sources of policy resistance that uh, was mentioned earlier. So by doing this, system dynamics can help facilitate learning with the aim of improving policy making. But uh, that's not all I would say. So let's take a look at the policy cycle as depicted in the green book. And the Green Book is the UK government's guidance on appraisal and evaluation for policies, plans and programmes. There is some overlap, of course, with the Magenta Guide. And it seems uh, here in the UK, we, we like our colourful books. There's a Green Book, a Magenta Guide, uh, an Aqua Book. Um, in, in case anyone from out the UK is uh, wondering what all those are. But um, in, in the Green Book, uh, the policy cycle is depicted as a, an iterative process, which includes evaluation. And it emphasizes that evaluation is needed throughout the policy development cycle. Um, in the Magenta Guide as well, it also says that evaluation should inform thinking throughout the cycle, the ROMEF cycle, so that's rationale, objectives, appraisal, monitoring, evaluation, and feedback. 
um, an evaluation should be happening before, during, and after uh, a policy is implemented. And this is the idea of policy evaluation as a practice. So it's not just a linear step in a process, but a key component of an iterative one. Now, system dynamics is also an iterative process, so it can contribute to evaluation throughout that policy cycle. Now, what we have coming up on the screen uh, uh, is a little bit overwhelming and there's quite a lot of detail, and I'm not gonna run through all of it. And um, the main message really with this diagram is that we can say that system dynamics can contribute to all parts of the policy cycle, not only in the appraisal or in evaluation, but in helping to come up with the rationale, the objectives, and during monitoring too. Um, and in this way, system dynamics can support the idea of evaluation as a practice. And these slides will be uh, made available after the presentation, so you, you can look through this uh, diagram in further detail at, uh, at your leisure. To simplify the same point a little bit, um, we can think about um, when we should be using system dynamics in the policy process. Well, of course, it's always uh, better to be involved at the uh, beginning of a plan or a program or a strategy. Um, and by using system dynamics, we have the opportunity to harness the properties of complex systems to our advantage. We can design policies focused on leverage points in the system so we can create a relatively big effect from a relatively small nudge. But of course, uh, system uh, circumstances uh, don't always permit us to do that. Uh, and uh, as with evaluation, so in system dynamics, we might only have the opportunity to be involved um, once the ball is uh, already rolling. So in which case we can use system dynamics uh, tools while a policy has been implemented. And um, we can do that to track its progress and guide any adaptation if necessary. And we can also use uh, system dynamics after a policy has been implemented as a way to look back and learn for the future. So to complete the second key message of the presentation today, um, system dynamics can also support policy evaluation by delivering complex systems insights throughout the policy cycle, as I like to say, a ready to go complexity toolkit. And in this way, we can say that system dynamics can support evaluation as a practice uh, rather than just as a step at the end. All right, so now that we know what system dynamics is, and I've taken you through a, a little pitch as to how system dynamics can tackle the challenges of uh, complexity and evaluation, we're now moving on to our third and final section of the presentation. And here I'll talk you through the insights that CCAN's research using system dynamics has uh, generated so far. To give you a bit of background to this research, so the context for this work was a, a CCAN fellowship that I had the opportunity to complete uh, during 2019. And this was in parallel to the European Masters in System Dynamics program that I was completing at the time. This program consists of uh, studying at the University of Bergen in Norway, uh, the New U University of Lisbon in uh, Portugal, and at Radboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. And uh, towards the end of, of that program, I conducted a, a master's thesis uh, research project, which was supervised by the University of Bergen, and it was conducted in partnership with CCAN uh, by the fellowship. Now, the real world problem that my research was focused on was the issue of soil degradation in England. And that's a problem for us uh, because it's leading to a loss of the benefits that uh, humans receive from nature or ecosystem services, as we call them. To unpick that uh, idea a little bit further, um, we know that soil is a natural capital stock and it provides important services like uh, climate regulation and water purification. But uh, the problem is that in England, soils have been degrading over the last two centuries and they're in quite a poor condition. How do we know they're in a poor condition? Well, soil organic carbon is one indicator of soil health. It's a, a measure of um, the organic matter that's present in the soil. And it's been declining in England during the 20th and early 21st centuries. And this loss of SOC, 
uh, as we call it, soil organic carbon, it results in significant economic costs um, because it results in a loss of ecosystem services. And these have been calculated to represent uh, a substantial sum of money, 560 million uh, pounds to the economy each year in England. So understandably, government organisations are keen to address this. And um, as set out in the 25 year environment plan for England, the target has been set of uh, ensuring all of England's soils are managed by uh, 2030 in, in a sustainable way. To support the 25 year uh, environment plan, the Natural Capital Committee, um, they are the, the government's uh, independent advisor on natural capital. And they've said that natural capital investments are needed to deliver the government's ambitions, including their soils targets. So this renewed interest in uh, soil health and also this recent enthusiasm for natural capital investment, it presents some interesting uh, policy evaluation and, and research challenges. And this is because we have a reasonable idea of how changes in soil natural capital stocks can influence the delivery of ecosystem services. However, we're less clear about how investment in soil natural capital will influence the dynamics between soil health, ecosystem services value, and the potential returns on that investment. And therefore, maybe the money that might be available for maintaining or further enhancing soil natural capital stocks over time. We're also aware that um, investment in soil natural capital involves intervening in a, in a complex system. Indeed, soils are complex systems and they are uh, themselves embedded in a complex uh, socio-ecological system. So when we're trying to design natural capital investment um, to tackle soil degradation, there are therefore all of those challenges as, as well as opportunities of complex systems to contend with. And uh, of course, the uh, spectre of policy resistance looms if we don't do that. There's therefore a, a strong need for a complexity appropriate evaluation in this area. And as always, uh, preferably in advance of any implementation. To support uh, such an evaluation, there were several research objectives uh, for my fellowship project. So the first one was to understand from a dynamic perspective, why soil degradation has been happening in England. And the second objective was to use that understanding to explore um, to what extent natural capital investments could be successful in uh, reversing soil degradation. So in essence, the idea was to, do, to uh, develop uh, an understanding of the problem, which could then be used in an evaluation to uh, inform policy design. The basic approach that was used um, was to synthesize existing knowledge out there about soil degradation, to, to synthesize that in a model, and then use that model as a laboratory uh, to explore how effective natural capital investments could be. To do this, uh, System Dynamics was built, and that was built by integrating existing knowledge uh, about soil degradation from a, a literature review. The model was tested under different uh, management scenarios against a reference field site at the uh, Rothamsted Experimental Station in England, and this was achieved through an iterative process of model building and testing. The model was then used to design natural capital uh, investment policies, and those were focused on uh, the leverage points which were identified while testing the model. Um, and the influence of those new policies on soil health was assessed against the ambitions of the 25-year environment plan. To summarise this process, uh, the first part was very much focused on um, developing an understanding of the problem, while the second part of the process was really focused on designing and evaluating potential policy options. The insight that this work provided about the problem of soil degradation was that it is actually a balancing feedback loop that drives the behaviour of the soil health indicator SOC. So this graph uh, compares simulations for two land management uh, regimes on a specific plot of land from 1852 to the present. And the results uh, correspond with real data for a specific uh, location at Rothamsted. 
So in the worst case, which is uh, indicated here by the red line on this graph, um, no crop residues or, uh, or manure had been added to the, to the land at all. Whereas in the best case indicated by the blue line, um, all crop residues uh, generated from the field as well as additional manure uh, was added fairly consistently over more than 150 years. And in both cases, we can see here that um, soil organic carbon exhibits behavior which is converging on a new equilibrium. So in other words, it's flattening, it, flattening out. And in system dynamics terminology, we call that a goal seeking behavior. Now, why, why, why would this happen? Well, this happens because of the structure governing organic matter. Okay. Um, larger stocks of soil organic matter represent a, a larger food resource for microorganisms. So more decay occurs, which releases more carbon as CO2 uh, from the, the stock of SOC. And this has important uh, implementation points for, for managing SOC stocks. So for example, if we want um, SOC to be maintained at a certain level, we would need to keep adding organic material at that rate forever and we'd get diminishing returns uh, on the rates of improvement we see um, if we were to maintain a, a constant input of organic matter. Now this is, this is the dynamic complexity of natural capital stock management. The contribution of this research uh, is that it integrates this loop um, with land management decision processes and uh, the value of related ecosystem services which was captured uh, in the model. To understand what the implications of this uh, dynamic complexity might be for policy, some simple uh, natural capital investment initiatives were designed using the model to, re to uh, introduce some reinforcing feedback processes to try to build up SOC stocks. The first policy that was tested uh, was a policy funded by the public, uh, the public purse, which would invest in uh, helping a farmer to calculate the economic benefits of improving SOC stocks to their own business. So this is a farm advice uh, initiative. The second policy was designed so the offsite uh, beneficiaries of soil ecosystem services, such as water companies, um, they could provide capital for land managers to improve SOC stocks. Now, Although the simulation results uh, did show that these policies could uh, create a reinforcing feedback loop to uh, promote improvements in SOC, biology always rules and uh, the simulated SOC levels always converged towards a new equilibrium, whatever the scenario. And this was because of this uh, balancing feedback loop that I mentioned before. Th this is important because um, it uh, determines how much and how quickly uh, natural capital investments could increase SOC by, say, a target year of 2030. The policy implication of this finding is that when it comes to investment in natural capital, initial conditions really matter. And to illustrate that, the model was used to compare how much, uh, or sorry, to compare how natural capital investment policies would perform. Um, for maintaining already healthy soils versus improving already degraded soils. So for the healthy soil, um, the policy generated a net positive investment in terms of ecosystem services value compared to just doing nothing and poten potentially uh, allowing degradation to occur. And good levels of SOC could actually be maintained and even slightly uh, improved over a 10 year time frame. And this is because the soils uh, are already of such a good status that um, uh, they're already generating significant ecosystem services benefits, which means investing in their maintenance uh, looks to be worthwhile for those who experience those benefits. For the degraded soil, uh, however, it, it was actually a different story. So it turned out to be a net negative investment compared to doing nothing. And um, SOC levels equivalent to the, uh, the best case or the healthy soil, they couldn't be achieved uh, within, the time, uh, with, within the time frame of 10 years. And this is because SOC had already bottomed out and it would take much longer to uh, reach the desired target level with um, realistic rates of uh, organic matter applications. 
So these, these findings highlight that, of course, it's uh, better to stop healthy soils degrading in the first place, uh, but also that it's a very good idea to invest in maintaining soils that are already in a good condition. Another possibility that was uh, suggested by these findings is a different type of policy design, which uh, wasn't explored in this research. And that's a policy which could um, potentially transfer the investment returns or the costs that were saved um, while maintaining already healthy soils to those um, parcels of land uh, with a very uh, poor soil uh, health status. So this could be some kind of transfer policy um, where we could transfer um, the value of ecosystem services uh, benefits across different land parcels or farm businesses and regions to help um, restore those uh, soils that are already badly degraded. Now, th th this research can be uh, considered as very much a first attempt at using system dynamics to tackle complexity in this arena of soil health and natural capital investment. So there's definitely some opportunities for improving on this research to develop uh, further insights. So th as I said before, the, the model that we have it is, uh, is based on a literature review. So the model could be uh, examined and refined together with uh, land and soil experts at DEFRA and Natural England, as well as also with farmers and, and other beneficiaries of soil ecosystem services like water companies. And this would help uh, to incorporate stakeholders' perspectives into the policy uh, evaluation process um, by using the model as a boundary object for facilitating communication about complexity. The refined model could also be used, of course, as a, as a micro world for designing and testing some more elaborate policies um, in a facilitated group setting. And these activities uh, could help provide a complexity capable policy evaluation um, for national initiatives to achieve uh, the 25 year plan objectives on soil health. In a slightly broader direction, the model could also be adapted to develop uh, an investment appraisal tool for potential investors in natural capital. And there seems to be a lot of discussion around these days about the need for blended finance and the importance of attracting private money to invest in nature. So we could use the existing model uh, as a foundation for, for building a, a complexity appropriate tool um, which we could use to engage with uh, private institutions. As a first step towards that, I would recommend that a market research exercise be uh, conducted to understand how complex systems are represented in existing uh, investment appraisal tools. So to conclude uh, this uh, third section of the presentation, we can say that CCAM's research using system dynamics has generated uh, the following insights. The first one is that uh, achieving the targets of the 25 year plan is subject to the dynamic complexity of uh, natural capital stock management. In this case, uh, soil natural capital stocks such as SOC. The other insight is um, that some kind of uh, capital transfer policy may be needed to ensure that we can invest in, in improving already badly degraded soils, um, which might take a longer uh, time frame to, to uh, deliver, um, as well as uh, maintaining those soils that are already uh, of a good status. To close the uh, presentation, I'd like to propose two ways in which I think uh, system dynamics can continue to contribute to CCAN's agenda and to help evaluators with handling complexity. The first is that I think there's a lot of potential for methodological cross-pollination between system dynamics and the other various methods that uh, CCAN has been showcasing. So system dynamics has features which could complement uh, some of those other methods to uh, tackle complexity in a, in a comprehensive way. My second suggestion is that um, because system dynamics has built up such a, a rich case history over the last 60 years, there's a lot that we can learn from how system dynamics has been used uh, successfully or indeed not so successfully in some cases um, for tackling complexity in policy practice. Um, and I'd like to refer here to uh, a recent paper which was uh, published by um, some researchers from CCAN. And that was, um, they identified that uh, complexity seems to be um, perceived 
by evaluators uh, more as a challenge or a difficulty to overcome. So there's a lot that we can do um, to emphasize that complexity is also an opportunity. Um, and there's plenty of opportunity, uh, sorry, there's plenty of examples uh, in system dynamics where that understanding of complexity um, as an opportunity has enabled to uh, help us to uh, harness the power of things like feedback loops. Um, so there's that experience there which we can uh, draw on to um, frame the benefits of getting gripped with uh, complexity in evaluation practice. If you're interested in learning more about system dynamics, uh, I'd really recommend checking out the uh, SD Society and their online course ca catalog, as well as the uh, Operational Research Society. There are also some great books out there, and a fantastic starting point is, of course, uh, Meadows Thinking in Systems. Um, and I've added a couple of papers there, uh, which you can uh, which you can click the links on when we send out the slides, uh, which I think demonstrate really well how the method works. You can, of course, uh, always contact me on LinkedIn, and uh, if you'd like to if you'd like to know more about my research or indeed system dynamics in general. And it just remains for me to say uh, thank you to CCAN for supporting my research through the fellowship, and thanks to everyone for attending the webinar today. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, that's an excellent overview of both the, the approach uh, and of some practical applications of it. Um, we've had quite a flurry of questions, um, some practical, some about clarification, and some more philosophical. So I'll start, start with the easier ones, and they get progressively harder. But uh, um, in um, practical, practical terms, there's one question, you know, are causal loop diagrams the same as the outputs from participatory systems mapping? Was the, one of the questions, and perhaps clarifying okay. the the relate you know, how those how those things differ because they they are slightly different. Yeah, mm. yeah, they're they're slightly di different. Um, so in participatory systems maps, um, uh, you can depict uh, feedback loops uh, and and show um, where they are and so on. But uh, I would say that like the causal loop diagramming has has developed sort of perhaps in parallel with that systems mapping uh, approach, they are similar. Um, but uh, I would say with system dynamics and the, the causal loop diagrams, the purpose is really to um, identify feedback loops and, and explore um, what that, that means um, for the problem we're trying to solve and, and the policy intervention. Um, when it comes to the, the participatory systems mapping, uh, at least my perception, uh, it could of course uh, be incorrect, but my perception is the idea to, uh, is to map out uh, the, the system uh, uh, very comprehensively to appreciate uh, how complex it is and then identify feedback loops uh, from that. Now, with the causal loop diagrams, we, we begin uh, building from uh, individual variables outwards to create those loops and um, so th they are similar uh, perhaps the focus is slightly different and, and maybe it's only subtle um, but probably the best uh, people to clarify that are actually um, that I understand there's a, a book coming out very soon comparing the different uh, participatory systems uh, mapping approaches uh, and that's coming out uh, by several um, researchers from CCAN. So uh, for those of you interested in that question, uh, I guess it's a, a watch this space and, and keep up to date with, uh, with that book that, that could help uh, clarify that matter a bit further. Okay, okay, great. And, th and a couple of questions about the, um, the software you use, the availability, and whether you uh, have any recommendations for software. Uh, and, on, and onto that, I'd add, you know, is this something which people can explore with a bit of general knowledge, or how, how do you build up that knowledge to use this, this approach? Okay, well, um, to, to tackle the, the question about the, um, the software, there is uh, various softwares available. So there is a, a, a software called Vensim, V-E-N-S-I-M, and they do have a freely available uh, educational version. Um, if you want to do some more fancy things with the models, then there's also some, uh, uh, more um, elaborate varieties that, that you can subscribe and, and pay for. And um, so if you're looking for a free option, that's a good place to look. Um, another good software which you do have to pay for is um, IC Systems uh, Stellar. 
Um, but there is a demo version available if you wanted to, to explore that. When it comes to how to build up uh, one's knowledge on, on system dynamics, um, as I said, the, the System Dynamics Society has a, an online uh, course catalog available uh, on, on their website. So you can take a look at that uh, course catalog and depending on whether you're a total beginner or have a basic understanding, there'll be a, a course there that, that probably meets, uh, meets your needs. And um, in addition to those formal courses, there are a lot of self-taught uh, people within the System Dynamics community. So it is possible to, to build up those skills uh, independently. Okay, great. Then we've got another question about the, um, whether the systems dynamic modeling process can accommodate and perhaps explore the effect of differing understandings of model structure. Okay, yeah, that, that's, um, that's actually the, the, the point of system dynamics and using it in a, in a participatory way. So there can be different understandings of the structure that um, is causing a particular problem or, or the type of uh, policy structure that should be introduced to, uh, to tackle it. So um, there's a series of uh, what we call scripts, which are um, like recipes for activities in uh, group settings of how you can um, uh, work with groups to build new structures or to compare different structures. And um, when we use things like uh, simulation, we can actually see what are the consequences of uh, understanding a problem in a certain way. So we can compare different structures to see if uh, the behavior that they generate um, corresponds with reality, so in data. And if there's a situation where we don't have data uh, for whatever reason, or uh, maybe we're, we're looking um, more into the, into the future and trying to think, well, what are our hopes and expectations uh, about what the future might look like? And um, we can compare those simulation results uh, with, with that data or our, our expectations. Um, perhaps a, a point sort of to add to that is um, system dynamics uh, does sort of take uh, some uh, structures for, for granted. So it's all about stocks, flows and feedback loops. Um, so it is a slightly different method, of course, to things like uh, agent-based modeling, which, which takes individual agents as, as the basic uh, unit of, of the modeling method. So um, if, in case that was sort of a, another point that the, the, uh, that the person asking the question was interested in, there is a way to um, combine system dynamics methods with agent-based uh, modeling approaches. And, and there's certain software like um, any, any logic that can facilitate that. So um, I'd say the system dynamics process can uh, accommodate different structures and, and we can also use it uh, with other, other methods which um, model things in a, in a different way. Okay. Building on that, there's one question about how, uh, was asked, they're not clear about how the modeling or well, system dynamic modeling handles emergence as a feature of complexity. And I guess that, that your previous answer about the agent-based modeling might be a, a way of... Uh, that, but mm. Well, the, 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 the um, I would say about emergence that that it's uh, that it's the idea that um, the behaviour is emerging from the structure. So we have many things that might exist in isolation, but it's when they come together and interact uh, in a series of feedback loops that the behaviour uh, emerges out of that. So. Um, the, the, the property of emergence is tackled through this um, understanding this relationship between structure and the behavior of uh, uh, stocks, flows, and uh, feedback loops and, and how they interact together. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm conscious of time. We've got lots more questions we could ask. There's one which is perhaps a quick one, which is not the necessarily most positive note to finish on, but the, what do you feel the, the limitations of the approach are? Uh, do a quick answer that. and then we've also had a longer question which gets into quite challenging ground which you know whether you feel the underlying philosophy of systems dynamic is shared with realist evaluation which um yeah uh yeah that general approach of thinking about context and mechanisms and mechanisms triggering in certain situations but not all mm -hmm. uh, in 30 seconds that's quick quick very quick answer. okay uh so uh, realist evaluation um we can design models and, and run them with different scenarios some of the scenarios might be more realistic than others um, and as for the limitations um i would say that the the limitations are probably similar to um 
uh, anyone who's using some some sort of complex uh, modeling uh, approach to tackling uh, complex problems. Um, depending on uh, the issue, there might not be agreement about uh, uh, what the, the issue is, and, and it might take um, quite a lot of time to get that traction with, with your client uh, to design a, a, an intervention that can, can happen quickly. Um, and uh, also, because it does take some time, it does take uh, a lot of input, um, it can be a little bit expensive. So these are some potential limitations uh, of the method. Okay, great. That's fantastic. Uh, well, it's two o'clock now, so I'm going to wrap up by saying thank you very much, Jonathan. That's been fascinating, very useful. The, the slides and uh, webinar will be put up on the CCAN website. And thank you to all the participants. So I, I hope you found it useful. And please do look at the CCAN website and consider signing up to the uh, CCAN uh, mailing list if you are interested in more of our activities. So with that, thank you everyone and goodbye and, and tune into the next webinar when we have one. Thank you.